Welcome to Cyboss. I'm so pleased to be hosting this session this morning and to welcome you all to Toronto, my Toronto. This is my hometown. And whether you're here with us in person or joining us digitally, this is a place of incredible dynamism, diversity, and this week, of course, so many distinguished guests, many of whom you'll see on this stage here today and throughout the week. Now, before we begin, I want to acknowledge where we are standing today is the traditional territory of many nations, among them the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It's the home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and it's covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. Now, we have an incredible four days ahead of us under the theme, Collaborative Finance in a Fragmented World. With a rich program across more than 550 sessions and more than 250 speakers, they'll be talking about payments, security, standards, tokenization, digital currencies, AI, ESG, and so much more. And of course, there are so many great networking opportunities that is such a hallmark of the Cyboss experience. Now, to kick things off this morning, we're going to hear from SWIFT CEO, Javier Perez Tasso, and Graham Monroe, and Samantha Emery, the chair and deputy chairs of SWIFT. After that, we'll hear from Brian Monahan. He's Bank of America's chair and CEO. He'll join us here on stage to round out this morning. We have lots to cover, so let's get started. I want to welcome to the stage Javier, Graham, and Sam. Please give them a warm welcome. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for being here and so delighted to have some time to talk with you this morning in front of uh, a wonderful audience and a welcome to Cyboss and a welcome to Toronto. It is such a dynamic time in the industry and we're seeing such rapid innovation in areas like digital currencies, tokenization, technologies like AI as we mentioned, uh, geopolitical shifts, all of that together uh, lending to this year's theme of course is uh, increasing fragmentation. So Graham, let's talk a little bit about the big themes that we expect to hear this week in Toronto and uh, what you think about the role of SWIFT and the SWIFT community uh, in this dynamic environment. Thank you, Janella, and let me add my welcome to, to, to everybody here. It's, it's certainly for, for me personally uh, very exciting and if I'm honest, a little bit nerve-wracking to, to be sat here for the first time as, as Swift's chair. But, but as, we, as we said, uh, I think if you look at the agenda that we have in front of us for Cyboss this week, it's packed full of some of those themes ar around the dynamic change that's going on, the transformation that, that's going on. I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, agenda. Janella already mentioned some of the themes that I think will come up. We, we, we've already referenced the, those transformation elements, the, the impact that artificial intelligence can have, tokenization, CBDCs, and, and so on. So I think those will all play a part, but I think there'll be other themes as well that, that you will hear us reference. Um, the, the whole focus around ESG, as, as we think about building a sustainable, long-term, and inclusive organization. Cybersecurity remains absolutely front and center for, for what the organization is, is doing for, for, some, for some very obvious reasons. And compliance as, as we think about trust and safety so that we can all rely on, on, on this environment. So I think all of those are, are gonna offer us up a, a great week. I'm, I'm sure that the, the SWIFT group themselves as well as, as all of the, the members in the, in the audience here are gonna have a fantastic time navigating through that. So looking forward to it. Sam, I'm, I'm sure there's some themes you would like to add to that list. Yes, thanks, Graham, um, and hello, everybody. So I, I think Janella covered a lot of it off in the, the question itself. The drivers are all clear, the macroeconomic picture, the geopolitical picture, the, the technological picture, and what that is bringing to all of us in our home institutions, the challenges and choices, right? So I think it's really incumbent on SWIFT to actually be coming to, to service the community, to bring that value add back into the community um, at this time more than ever. And, and Javier, I wanna get you to, to chime in here as well. Uh, against this backdrop that we're talking about, how is SWIFT playing a role? 
Uh, well, uh, hello everybody as well. Uh, well, listen, we just heard from uh, from Graham and Sam uh, at the end. I mean, if you take all of these things combined, uh, the, this rise of fragmentation is already having knock-on effects on our industry, uh, and uh, and actually it's coming up pretty much in every conversation we're having these days with uh, all our stakeholders, customers, regulators, policymakers, uh, and it's driven, yes, by uh, geopolitical and, and economic shifts, but also by the massive technological innovation that we see around us, yes, big techs, fintechs. Uh, you have, uh, of course, new technologies, and we hear a lot about AI. Also, by the way, the uh, uh, regulatory and ethical side of AI uh, throughout the conference this week. Um, and as well, uh, Graham referred to it, uh, uh, new forms of value, CBDCs, tokenization of assets that are already impacting the way we operate uh, in the industry. Um, and all of this obviously has huge uh, opportunities and, 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 and possibilities ahead of us, but at the same time, it brings complexity. Uh, and it brings complexity at a time where uh, both the industry and policymakers are focusing on uh, improving customer experience in international transactions across the board through the uh, G20 uh, targets when it comes to speed, cost, uh, transparency, choice, and access. And well, asking about SWIFT, obviously, over the past uh, few years, we've been uh, uh, focusing with the SWIFT community on addressing those. I mean, uh, just to take uh, each one of them in, in order, I mean, we'll talk about speed. Uh, already today, 89% of all SWIFT payments uh, get to the recipient bank within an hour. And if you take half of all of these transactions, uh, reach end beneficiary account within five minutes. So well within the ambitious target that the G20 has set up of 75% end-to-end -end, uh, within an hour by 2027. Um, same we're on in terms of cost, we're stripping out millions, if not billions, uh, from the industry uh, in terms of uh, cost by automating. Uh, increased automations with uh, the adoption of ISO 2022 reach standards, but also by pre-validating transactions before they're actually sent. End-to-end uh, -end transparency is key as well, uh, not only in payments, by the way, but also in securities now. Uh, that is, is an area that uh, is, is taking traction. And of course, as, as this expands, and we expand all of these capabilities into the uh, consumer and SME segments with uh, Swift Go, it is an area where, obviously, uh, it's great to share all of this progress year on year at Cybos, but I think maybe the takeaway is that it's more important than ever that, uh, that we maintain that momentum and that we as a community focus on the next couple of years of in adopting and using all of these new capabilities, all of these new innovations that at the end are not only going to help to get to fast and frictionless transactions, but also secure and trusted. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, crucial and clearly will frame a lot of the discussions this week. Mm, yes, we're looking forward to some of those discussions this week. Graeme, you talked a little bit about feeling a little daunted being here uh, as chair. Uh, can you share with us some of your aspirations as chair and some of the key areas you want to focus on with the SWIFT board? Great, thank you. I, I think I would probably summarize that in, in three um, areas of focus. I don't think there'll be a surprise to, to anybody that number one in that list, operational excellence. I think this is a, a, an area where Javier and the entire group at Swift already do a fabulous job. I think they have best in class capabilities. I think what's in front of us now is to continue to develop those capabilities so that we stay best in class. So I, th I think that's probably the, 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 fir the first area w we would call out. The second one, and, and Javier has already mentioned some of those areas, uh, I, I think Swift has developed a series of newer capabilities over recent years. I think those are all targeted at how we improve the, the financial market infrastructure that, that we are working within across the payments world, across the securities world, across other elements of the, of the financial space. I think allowing Swift to pursue those capabilities further and, and think about how we can apply those to increased frictionless, fast to, to deliver capabilities, I think will be a super area for, for us to focus on. So we really wanna work through how we can think about adoption and penetration in those areas. The last area I would call out, and this has been a, a, a very joined up set of thinking from the overall board, which I joined earlier this year, so I think everybody has a, a, a strong voice in this, is how we think about world-class governance. SWIFT has done a great job to, to get to this point, but governance continues to change. 
and we want to ensure that we are in front of that governance from all perspectives. So I think that those three areas will be something that really drives the agenda for us at the board, working closely with, with the, the ex-co. I think there's uh, some very interesting things to get after there. And Sam, what about for you? Can you talk about your aspirations as deputy chair? And, and particularly, I know uh, that uh, you're very tapped into the ESG agenda that we have heard uh, both Javier and Graham mention. Yes, absolutely, Janella. So I think most of my time away from SWIFT is spent in the areas of innovation, strategy, transformation. And one of the things that I always find it really important to stay tuned into, whether you're looking at it from a firm level, whether you're looking at it from an industry level, is the status quo. And as needs change, as dynamics change, ultimately as the context changes, whether or not it's holding you back. And I think Javier and all of the executive team have done an absolutely fantastic job of considering this through the lens of business strategy. But as Graham touched on, I've been, since coming into the board and, and joining as deputy chair, been really encouraging them to dial that up and look at how we can consider it across different facets of the organization, looking at the governance, looking at the culture, um, which is really, really important. And then coming to, to the second part of the question on ESG, um, it's been skyrocketing up the agendas of businesses globally, which I think we can all agree is, is a really positive thing. And it is a red thread throughout the whole program this week. So there's so much excellent contact that I just encourage you to, to get connected in with. But I also think it's a really natural focus area for SWIFT as an organization. And you might say, why, Sam? I don't quite get that. But it kind of just involves you just taking your mind back to 50 years ago, to 1973, and thinking about why that group of stakeholders from different countries around the world came together. And it was in pursuit of solving common problems, common challenges, um, and not just because it, it needed to be done, but ultimately to build more inclusive and more sustainable economies, which fundamentally is at the heart of ESG. So I personally feel like there's a huge opportunity for um, the entire SWIFT cooperative and the community itself to come together in pursuit of furthering those ESG goals. And this, this might take various forms. Um, you could be looking at all of that ISO 2022 rich data, which we've now got the, the opportunity to exploit, looking at better insights for capital flows to support climate action. Um, you could, as, as Javier's alluded to, um, consider it through the lens of fiercely defending what is um, an inclusivity that comes with interoperability uh, that I think is really key for the global financial services community. Or indeed, as, as Graham has touched on, more locally for us from a board perspective, how we can make sure that we continue to evolve, that we continue to bring in that diversity of skill set, that diversity of person, so we are able to best serve you. Graham, I want to get you to just uh, jump in on uh, something that uh, Sam just mentioned, and that's rich data and uh, the community's migration to ISO. Can you talk a little bit about how the transition is going and uh, from, from a wider community perspective? So, so ISO 2022, um, Javier and I were talking about it the other day and saying that this, this whole program has been several years in the baking, but we finally took it out of the oven in March this year and, and I think uh, are now live with it. And I think that's a major step forward. I think that's a foundation block for, for changing the simplicity, changing the investig investigability of how we think about the, the SWIFT environment. I think having that rich and structured data really allows us to, to change the dynamics on how we service clients throughout this. Things will be quicker. Things will have more intelligence applied to them. Things will, will be able to, to change and improve how we deliver client service and experience through that, and maybe even how we change and improve clients' ability to make decisions th through that platform. So I think ISO will, will be a real foundation block for the next phase of, of SWIFT's development. 
And I think it's incumbent on all of us as, as we think about driving that out to, to ensure that, that we can make it um, as penetrative and, and as successful as, as possible. I think if you look back at some statistics, I think we're now running at 15% of our global payments vol volume is, is running through the, the ISO platform. We, we'd like to conclude this in 2025, so we have a, a steep um, set of implementations to, to get through. I think everybody should be looking to, to map and plan the, those implementations in their environment. And as we get to, to that next stage, I think you're gonna see some great benefits get delivered. Javier, let's look forward. Um, you described a lot uh, happening three years into this instant and frictionless journey. So where is Swift headed next? Well, uh, indeed, I mean, we are still in that uh, journey towards instant frictionless, and maybe to, to think about what's next, uh, let's, let's uh, take stock of where we are at the end. Uh, today, Swift connects, uh, as you know, uh, in excess of 11,500 uh, endpoints across more than 200 countries. Uh, actually, we carry roughly the equivalent of the GDP of the world uh, every three days, uh, more or less, uh, and that it happens through uh, essentially 33,000 corridors and actually accessing, thanks to the great job uh, done at the domestic and regional level by market infrastructures, it allows us to reach 4 billion accounts. And it, that is the journey towards instant frictionless across 4 billion accounts in all of these countries. Uh, we've made, as uh, uh, Graham just referred to it, a great progress in uh, to, uh, upgrading the platform, upgrading the, the, the rails uh, with uh, uh, towards that vision of instant frictionless with uh, using API and, uh, and cloud technology to build new capabilities. Uh, so, you know, to some, to some point, the reason of existence of SWIFT, which is to interoperate the industry, is now being taken to the next level. But then going forward in the future, maybe this word, buzzword, maybe interoperability, uh, uh, there are a couple of challenges that, uh, that we'll be facing as an industry. Um, a couple of challenges emerging and, and probably will mature into that. Um, the first one, uh, and that have the potential, by the way, to uh, create further friction and, di and digital islands across the board. So the way we need to address those two challenges of interoperability, the first one being essentially as new uh, technologies uh, and uh, you know, forms of value are coming on stream, CBDCs, tokenization of assets, um, uh, we are already innovating in making sure that we can uh, uh, flow seamlessly uh, between uh, existing and new uh, forms of value, and that's uh, paramount. Uh, we'll be announcing this week the beta testing of our CBDC connector, as well as the second round of the sandbox experiments uh, with 30 central and commercial banks uh, now looking and exploring new areas like uh, linking digital trade platforms, uh, uh, foreign exchange models, and liquidity saving mechanisms. So, so a big area of focus as well in security, in security space, with uh, uh, now uh, we have just recently announced uh, the uh, results of the experiments that uh, through the SWIFT network we can allow firms to uh, uh, transfer uh, value, tokenized value, uh, across uh, several uh, public and uh, private blockchains. So as these technologies mature, uh, we'll be able to connect them seamlessly, seamlessly to, the, um, to the backbone of the global finance. So that's one big area of focus. The other one, it's a fact of life that uh, there's going to be new, many more ways to move money, not fewer. Uh, clients are going to demand more choices, not less, uh, and uh, that obviously creates uh, huge opportunities and growth uh, in terms of innovation, but as well uh, increased complexity uh, on how uh, flows will move uh, across uh, banks, fintechs, card networks, uh, and, uh, and to do that in a seamless way with the adequate and right levels of risk and control. And that's, as we expand into, into SME and, and the consumer segments, um, we are uh, working increasingly more with many new players at Swift uh, to make sure that uh, we not only help them scale their, their business uh, through the adoption of, as well, all of our new capabilities. We mentioned some, anomaly detection, uh, pre-validation of transactions, uh, just to name a few. But as well, I think more importantly, is uh, how going forward, we uh, are, regardless of whether the transaction is initi initiated through the SWIFT network 
and end is delivered to the end beneficiary through a different network or vice versa that we can provide end-to-end -end tracking and integrity, data integrity, uh, which are both paramount if we want to achieve seamless uh, transactions that are also secure and trusted. So uh, looking forward to how all of this payment optionality is actually going to drive uh, many new innovations. And we'll have lots of time to have those conversations uh, throughout the week. A final question to Sam. Uh, we heard the priority the board is placing on operational ex excellence and building out future strategies. So can you talk to us a little bit about your take on innovation? Uh, what does the board see as priorities in that space? Sure. So I think on joining the board, I was, I was really impressed to see the innovation agenda that Javier and the team have, have put forward as I think are, are the rest of the board. And it's almost quite humbling to think about the role that SWIFT plays in readying the community for an era that includes all of the buzzwords we've been talking about, CBDCs, artificial intelligence, tokenization, um, which is absolutely fantastic. But those are the things that are always going to hit the headlines. They're going to get the white papers. They're going to get the consultancy papers, all of that stuff. Um, but you can't underestimate the amount of activity that is going on beneath the waterline. Um, the innovation that is happening at the level of the core infrastructure, um, which is key and, and fundamental. And so for me, I think operational excellence has to be underpinned by innovation. Um, whether you are looking at um, things like where your future data centers um, might sit, you're looking at moves to the cloud, you're thinking about getting into um, and reckoning with an era of quantum, um, it's all fundamental. And so I speak with great confidence on behalf of all of the, the directors to, to, to really underline the fact that we do see innovation as key. Um, but actually not just key, it's fundamental um, for the, the future success and the sustainability of the cooperative and the community as a whole. Okay, one, one more uh, before I let you go. Um, this is my first Cyboss, so I want to ask you all what you're most looking forward to this week, if you can just kind of give me a rapid fire across the room here. Uh, Graham? For, for me, it's, it's all about actually all of you. It's all about relationships. It's all about the community and, and getting to know those things a little bit better. Sam? So I, I definitely echo that, but I'd also add I'm really interested to get into the Inno Tribe agenda, make sure I leave this week with that clear line of sight on the horizon as to where we're going next. And Javier? Well, uh, as well, uh, maybe net new, uh, I would say uh, spending time as much as possible uh, during the event to listen to the conversations and, uh, and the thought-provoking speakers that we're going to have this, this, this week. So it's, uh, it's, I've seen the list, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and as well, simply the buzz, the buzz of being out there and exchanging, and, uh, and it's such a great experience that I'm uh, really looking forward to the next four days. I want to thank all three of you for taking the time to join me here on stage. Can we give them a round of applause? And before we, before we uh, ask you to, uh, to exit, I'll hand things over to Javier. He's going to introduce our next speaker. Yes. Yes, so thank you, Janela. And, and yes, indeed, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Brian Monaghan, uh, chair of the board and CEO at Bank of America, as indeed our opening speaker. Uh, so Brian joined the bank in 93, uh, and before becoming CEO in 2010, uh, he took a turn running all the operating unions with the bank. So uh, he knows the bank inside out. Uh, in his current role, he created Bank of America's focus on what he calls responsible growth, a business model that uh, has delivered excellent results for the bank and its stakeholders as a whole. Uh, in addition uh, to Brand's long list of uh, accomplishments and accolades, uh, he is well known for his commitment to uh, uh, many public DNI and sustainability initiatives across the board and also participates in several organizations that focus on economic and market trends. So this gives him, of course, a uh, broad perspective, uh, and I'm really very much looking forward to hearing uh, from Brian today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming on stage Brian Monaghan. Thank you. So 
I want to start with a question on the economy, because as CEO of Bank of America, you have a front row seat uh, to the U.S. and the global economy. So just walk us through some of the key drivers uh, right now, where you see the economy headed in the next six months, because there are a lot of people looking and eagerly wondering where things are going to go. Well, first, Danielle, thank you for having me here. Thank you all for coming. I hope you have a great week, and thank you to my teammates for all here in strong force uh, to work with their clients and learn more about what's going on out there. So um, when you think about the economy around the world, we have the research team we have, you know, obviously tracks all over the world is the best research team in the world. And they've come to the conclusion that you're going to see the U.S. avoid a recession. Now, they've come to that reluctantly over the course of the last year, year and a half. They've always had a pre recession predicted sort of four quarters out and that pushed out and pushed out. But finally, just the momentum has them having the economy trough in the second, in the middle two quarters, in, in the middle part of next year, second, third quarter, and then come back out. And ultimately, by 25, gets back to trend growth. Now, so, you know, if we think about that, they have rates uh, going up one more time this year and start being cut mid next year. And so, but if you need to think about it, you need to back up and think about what's going on. We had tremendous fiscal stimulus in response to the pandemic around the world. We also, we also had uh, monetary accommodation by a drop in rates. And for the first time, that may combine in, in the developed economies, including the US and Europe, to have a real interest rate with a high nominal rate. And so they need to shut down the inflation, and they've achieved real interest rates, which frankly was elusive, was elusive during a lot of times after the global financial crisis. They took a while to believe it was true, and that was a debate about transitory. And now the risk is really the opposite, which is how long do you hold it here before you tip it over? Mm -hmm. And that's the debate that's going to go on. You're going to see it this week. You're going to see it continue to go on because they're in uncertain territories. Now, f for all of you that operate around payments and deposits and money movement, you know, if you're under 40, odd years old, you haven't seen a real rate environment. And so I feel like a curmudgeon saying that, but our teammates have to adjust to a whole different world where cash is not free and cash costs money and line usage is very carefully crafted and deposit where people are going to put deposits is very crafted. And that's what's really going on. And that's what's really working its way through the economy. So a soft landing, so to speak, an economy which comes back out, but the risk is more to the air of over hiking and not letting the lag of the economy move in the U.S. than it is uh, uh, to, the, to the other ways right now. Mm. Let's talk about something that's a big topic of conversation, not just in, in, in this industry, but across many, and that is generative AI. Right. And uh, let's talk specifically about how it's being used at the bank, and maybe more specifically how it's not being used. Yeah. Well, I think you know, the idea of having uh, models work on data and information, you know, that is not new. The idea of having it run on its own and learn from itself, that is kind of interesting and, and different. And so we've had a lot, we've had experience with this, although it's still early stages. And so, you know, the, a couple things come up. One is how do you actually use it? And so about 10 years ago, we realized that you were going to need to take the, you know, millions and millions of customer interactions we get on our consumer side a day um, and try to figure out how to automate that even beyond the classic digital implementation. And so we started with a natural language that went to uh, outsiders and got a natural language developed for financial services because the question what's my balance means different things if you ask it outside the financial services realm mm -hmm. like you might get an invitation to yoga class out of that <laughs> um, so we had to do a natural language and we had to operate across 110 systems and it had to be precisely right and it had to have connectivity where a person driving 60 to miles an hour talking to the thing with the w top down on a convertible would expect to get instantaneous correct response um, and so you had to work at it carefully. And that sort of brings up the debate about the thing. It, the, the question is, is your data arrayed? Is it accessible? Is it a place you can grab it? Are you sure it's right? Can it understand the question? Can it answer the question? And can it learn from that? Mm -hmm. That's a product called Erica, which is used, this quarter will be used 200 million times um, to give you a sense. Every one of those would have been an email, a phone call, or some other direct interface. So think about the difference between having that machine operate. And we're announcing uh, you know, here at Cybos, we're bringing that to the cash pro side of Bank of America, that same technology to help corporate treasurers and, and other people sort of ask the questions in a natural way and have it analyzed. That being said, that's sort of a, a very straightforward version of this. You know, to let the generative AI models operate, you know, just untethered is, is a tricky execution. But we think that has very high value where 
you know, a lot of times you can say yes faster with it. And that's an interesting question, because if I say yes to something, you know, I may put the bank at risk, but I don't put a customer at a, at a risk. And, and so you have to think about where you can use it faster and where you can use it slower. It can ride side by side with computer programmers. That's a proven execution, and we're delivering that today, which it enhances the value of programming faster and can help do a lot of the drudgery, so to speak, in programming. We think it can help in a lot of the testing environments we have. So there's a lot of places we can use it. We have five or six active pilots going along with you know, Erica, which is coming into the cash pro side. And, and we think there's great movement ahead, but we've got to be careful to get it right because there's real customers and real decisions and real activity. And when you talk about what all you do out there for a day, a lot of money moving very fast that if it gets mucked up, it's not going to be a good day. Absolutely. <laughs> so much going on behind the scenes where for the user, it's just an instantaneous interaction. So AI, just one of the ways that uh, you know, you're using t uh, technology and financial services continues to evolve. But one of the things that hasn't changed is the continued focus on payments. Can you just talk a little bit about why that is so important? Well, in the end of the day, you know, especially for if you're a charter bank, you really exist for two reasons. What defines a bank? You take deposits and make loans. That's it. That's the definition of a bank. If you go look at the statutes, and we've existed for 100 years that way. Our company is almost 240 years old now, in the oldest parts of it. So the other day, payments are critical. So what does that mean for our corporate customers, to our consumer customers, to our markets customers? It's all about how they move the economy and how they express it. Is dollars and cents or whatever currency moving between them to affect the, uh, uh, the expression of the economy? So it's all what we do. And so we have to, as the panel before me spoke about, and Javier spoke about eloquently, it's got to be, you know, in the end of the day, you've got to invest a lot in technology generally, but also in the payments technology, because it is our protected turf. It is the reason we are here. It is the reason why we might be missed if we weren't here. And the question then is, how do you invest in it? And so you've got to invest in it to be you know, more secure, more informative with the customers, you know, uh, faster, simpler, lower cost. And we're on a relentless cost drive across all this. That's where... You know, an organization like SWIFT, and, and it becomes critically important. We can externalize those costs and cooperative among industry and the 50 year ago history was, we can't do this on our own, so we do use these organizations to drive it, but the relentless need really plays off the whole reason why banks exist, was to hold people's money, to lend it to them if they wanted to do something more than their current cash flow provide, and then to keep that all straight and then we've added markets and other things to it over time, but that's in ca asset management. But in the end of the day, behind that is just simply people trusting us to move their money, report on it accurately, get it to the right place, get it with the information they want, and do it over and over and over again, you know, literally trillions of times a day. Mm. So uh, let's talk about uh, collaboration, because here at Cybos, there's going to be a lot of, of opportunity, hopefully, for collaboration. Can you talk about how financial institutions are working together to make that payment system better? Yeah, and so I think you, you heard some of the dialogue uh, earlier, but I think in the end of the day, with all the stuff that's going on out there, the cybersecurity uh, uh, question that was raised earlier, the need for frictionless payments, the need for speed, the need to connect uh, uh, payment systems that weren't necessarily connected, you know, these are the things that we need to do in collaboration, collaboration among participants allows us to let that happen. And it, you know, when we think about whether it's real time in the U.S. and development of that, whether it's you know, the need to, um, you know, to send the messaging and, and the ISO 2020, 020, 20 whatever it is, uh, <laughs> I it, had know, to learn that need one. to get that all right and stuff. <laughs> you know, these are just things, no, no company, even if you could do it on your own, it's worthless to do it on your own because then you're standing outstanding by yourself. And so if you think about something as simple as, uh, you know, Visa, Visa was a Bank of America credit card called Bank of America credit card originally, and it was given to the industry to democratize it through the industry to make it effective. It was never going to be effective as a single per bank's uh, uh, thing. And so these collaborations are critically important. And the ability to, to learn from each other, the ability to en enhance each other's understanding, the ability to connect the diverse economies, the you know, 200 or so countries in the world, and, and make sure the payment system works for you know, all different profiles of companies, uh, the largest and most sophisticated and the most rural and small in, in developing con uh, economies, all that is critically important. And if you don't have organizations like a SWIFT, it just isn't going to happen. And, and that's where 
you know, the collaboration is so critical. And what's encouraging when 8,000 people plus show up in uh, Toronto, Canada for a week to exchange ideas and information and, and learn from each other, you know, that shows our industry is actually trying to tackle this basic question, which is how do we make the world's economies function better and function, frankly, it's also UN General Assembly Week, function along the sustainable development goals, providing uh, uh, development growth that is fair to all societies. Therefore, it will go on with much more vigor. And I think that's a great place to leave it. I'm sure many here will be contemplating that and having those conversations here at Cybos. Ryan Monahan, the CEO of Bank of America, thanks so much for your time. Please a warm thanks. round of applause for him. Thanks. So with that, uh, we've almost come to the end of today's plenary. Uh, I do want to bring to your attention one more thing we've been talking about today, and that is ESG. Uh, we've heard it's one of the leading topics here at the conference this week, and uh, not just with the program, but also around the venue. Every year, with your help, Cybos welcomes more and more sustainable, uh, it becomes more and more sustainable, rather, and we're aiming to make it one of the most sustainable events in the world. Now, we know that we can only make that possible with your meaningful help. This year, there are many initiatives to lead the change, and you'll find lots of easy and tangible actions to do during this week. All you have to do is look for the Cybos Sustainability Pledge. It's in the app. It just takes a few seconds to add your support. And every small action contribute, contributes to making a bigger difference. So thank you for that. I hope you've all had a fantastic morning. Uh, let's not forget, we're really just getting started here at Cyboss. There's so much to look forward to this week. And I want to make sure that you enjoy everything that Cyboss and the city of Toronto, my hometown, has to offer. So I want to send you off and wish you well uh, this week. I hope you have a fantastic time here at Cyboss. <laughs>